an honor to be sitting right now with Carolyn Forche. Nice who's to be the here. author of so many books of your own poetry, but uh, most recently, the poetry of witness, the tradition in English. Mm -hmm. And you're holding a copy of that right I now. I am, yes. This is the and book. also your very famous uh, book, Against Forgetting, from 1993 now. Yes. It's been mm -hmm. a while. 20th mm -hmm. Century Poetry of Witness. You're the editor of both these books. Yes. You're also a poet yourself, though. Yes. And you've, been, you've traveled to Central America and other places and written some wonderful books about what you've seen there. Thank but you. But I want to start with the idea of poetry of witness and what that means and where it came from for you. After my second book was published, which was regarded as a fairly political book, it was about events in Central America in the late 70s, um, I wanted to open a space for thinking about politics independently of how we usually conceive of politics. Um, I wanted to open a social space, the space that actually the Founding Fathers originally intended, a place of debate, of press publication, of, of publication of literature, uh, of dis public discussions, deliberations, the, the original pub uh, uh, meaning, uh, you know, where people would go into the taverns and have arguments about current affairs. And I thought that is where poetry belongs, in that social space between the intimacy of the hearth, the home, domestic life, and the institutions of the state. And I didn't want to be restricted to ideological politics. I didn't think that, I agreed that that didn't have a place in poetry, a, a strong ideological um, message, message-driven work. It's not, it doesn't leave the poem open enough to the magic of the unconscious and, and the expressivity of the human soul. So. I was trying to f figure out how can we read works by people who've endured extremity and suffering, war, exile, house arrest, torture, banning orders, uh, denial of entry for immigrants, people who've been through that kind of thing and then subsequently written. Whatever they write about in the aftermath of that experience is going to be marked by that experience and that suffering, uh, indelibly so, including the language itself, I think is marked and it passes through extremity. So I began to collect this work from all over the world and uh, I had boxes and boxes and boxes of it in my house and, uh, and I thought I was Xeroxing it for my students. And then uh, finally it became the first anthology against forgetting. It's a long story, but um, I believed that it would be useful for teachers to share this symphony of utterance of poets of the 20th century. You know, it would, was the story of the history of the 20th century according to the world's poets. Yeah. So when you were younger and, and mm -hmm. looking at poetry, this wasn't the type of poetry that you would consider. It was a world you didn't probably know no, yet. No, I didn't. I mean, these are people who've gone through extraordinary... Right things, torture, as you mentioned, yes. um, house arrest, death. That's um, right. And we're chronicling, they were reporters of sorts uh, of that. They, there, was a, there was a journalistic element to the poetry at the time. Well, it was, a, I, think, um, I think they can't help but write. Sometimes they can't help but write about it in the aftermath of enduring it. And often they feel that they're speaking on behalf of others, perhaps others who didn't survive, perhaps of the dead. This is particularly true of poets of the Holocaust who felt that they could not be silent in the aftermath of the concentration camps and the death camps. And so even if they put the pen to paper, poets usually don't know what they're going to do. They write and they begin to follow an image or a line and and they bring from with deeply within themselves the language that's sufficient to their moment. And I think certain subjects, um, for example, Paul Salon's poems uh, that emerged out of the Holocaust are necessary and urgent poems that can't help but be written. Poets can't really choose what they write, um, as you've probably heard from a number of poets. Yeah. Um, and, but I, I do think that the poems I grew up reading were mostly English language poets who were not presented as having suffered at all. And I usually, because I went to Catholic school, I read them in abridged version. So the, the Catholic nuns would take out all the bits they didn't want children to see. Right. And we read Chaucer and Shakespeare and 
I thought all poets were dead when I was a child. So it was part of your own poetic education, this idea yes. that behind um, some of these great mm -hmm. famous poems and sometimes not so famous, but these great poets yeah. was suffering oftentimes. That's right. That's and right. to sort of start to see the reality of that changed right. your life and changed your career entirely. Deeply and utterly. And the, I was wrong about the English language poets because I was raised in a tradition that imagined that poets were not political and that poetry was above all of the affairs of the world. And it wasn't connected to anything that was happening that was controversial or oppositional in any way. And then my colleague Duncan Wu and I began gathering. Duncan is an Oxford professor of romantic poetry. And he proposed, he said, you know, if we reread English language poetry of the past 500 years, I bet we'll discover that most of them are poets of witness. And so we began to do this. And we discovered that that was indeed true. And most of the major English language poets of the last 500 years are collected into the volume we began to do this one, which is 500 Years of English Language Poetry of Witness. And um, it's an amazing book because yeah. it's not only just the poems, but you provide but, the context behind the poems. Yeah. And you, you help us understand that, that discovery that you made. We, we wrote the biographical notes that precede each selection. To, we wanted to tell the story of these poets. Why are they here? What happened to them? And so if you just read the book first, reading all the biographies, you get this incredible story of English language poetry and where it really emerged from. Yeah. And then you can go back and read all of the poems and yeah. you have this symphony of utterance and it's quite beautiful. I can give you an example. Yeah, I love one. Um, this one surprised me. I'm sure there are many people who knew this. I did not know it. There was a British poet, John Newton, born in 1725. He was conscripted into Her Majesty's Royal Navy when he was 23 years old to fight in the Austrian War of Succession. And he didn't want to be on that ship. He tried to escape. He was captured and he was put in leg irons and he was flogged with a cat of nine tails in front of the other sailors. It was very, very brutal for him. And then after that, he was transferred to a slave trading vessel. And he tra transported the slave cargo for years. He eventually became captain of his own slave ship. And as captain of that slave ship, he tortured people, including children. You know, he brutalized the slaves under transport and the sailors under his command. And then one night in March 1748, there was a storm at sea. His ship started breaking up. It was heavily damaged. They all thought they were going to die that night. He prayed and prayed and prayed. And in the morning, they woke up and they were still alive and the ship was still sound and in the water. But it changed him. And he began to repent of his slave transporting past. And slowly he came around to a very altruistic and loving comportment toward his fellow human beings. And he wrote, one of the things that he wrote was this. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. So the song we all sing at funerals and vigils and memorial services and protest marches is a song written by a man who what we would once describe as an evil man, you know, and who had himself gone through a lot of extremity and imposed it on others. A wretch like me. A wretch like me. And he literally means it that way. Yeah. So there were these exciting moments with this, with this work. And with the other one, Against Forgetting, which was the earlier volume, that was poets writing in 30 languages from all over the world, beginning with the Armenian genocide and ending at Tiananmen Square uh, with the uprising of the democracy movement. Uh, because that was the last historical event that happened before I sent it off to the publisher. Yeah. And while I was compiling that one, the Soviet Union was breaking apart. So I kept calling consular offices and embassies, what do you call your country now? And are you independent? And, you know, because uh, the breakup of the Soviet Union became part of that story. And 
we were to usher in a period of peace then, as you recall, the right. peace dividend, you know, we were going to have this wonderful post-war, post-Cold War time on earth yeah. with the new millennium. So Bosnia, Herzegovina, Rwanda, um, Darfur, all of the tragedies of the latter 20th century aren't here, nor are the horrific wars over, um, in, in response to 9-11 included. So there's, it's time for another one, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and we in our country have entered a particularly difficult moment. So what do you make of that? Um, the poetry of witness, this, this concept, basically you coined this idea of the poetry of witness. And, and we're talking about Rwanda and Darfur and 9-11. Mm -hmm. These are true um, travesties. And then right. we have a situation now that I wouldn't put in that category by any means. But you're seeing a response from the, um, the poetry and writing communities yes. to it right it's, now. It's a very strong response. We'll be in front of the White House tomorrow night with our candles and our poetry. We're going to make a vigil for freedom of expression for the First Amendment. And here we had a little um, hand-holding march in, in this hall. It was I the first time I'd ever seen that at a book fair. Yeah. And the other thing is that the, po the poets are, and the writers are awake. They've been activated. They will protect their First Amendment and they'll protect immigrants and they'll protect other people. They're all taking actions every day and communicating with each other. So I don't have to make much of a case for defending poetry of witness anymore. I, I mean, it's not controversial as it once was yeah. for a poet to be engaged in the world and to be writing out of active engagement. It's a new time. And I'm so, I'm so moved by the courage of the young poets now. And it, it's, uh, they've awakened in a new place, I think. And I never thought I would live to see this. I'm happy I did. So the work that will come out of this moment, it takes a while sometimes for that to start surfacing. You yes. start seeing some things immediately, but after a while you start seeing a reaction to that in the artistic community, the groups, the collectives that form. Yes. Well, it, t it takes time to write. In the, for me, often it takes a couple of years after something happens before it visits me on the page. You know, and oh, now I'm writing about this. It takes time to process, for, for the experience to enter uh, the consciousness deeply and to be assimilated by the consciousness so that the poet still has access to all the associational magic of the imagination while the poet is writing. And so I, I think we're going to see, perhaps 10 years from now, the result of what's happening now. That's a long time. I mean, yeah. what you're seeing right now is like, um, like literally days after the election, there was a march in Washington. Right. And then now there's, a, it, it, it feels sometimes a little scattershot. Like things are happening, you're, there's a, reaction and a reactionary element to it. You yeah. don't have that distance right. to be thoughtful. At the same time. time, there's a hunger for right now. Right. And yeah. like, I think that the literary community, the poetry community has a, um, an opportunity and a role to play there. Right. But how do you do that? Well, they're that reaching back to the- Associative element yeah. you mentioned and still, well, they, right now. they can't write immediately about what's happening to them, right. but there, there is a rich tradition of literature that they can draw from now. Um, Let America Be America Again yeah, by Langston, Langston Hughes. Hughes. That can be read in front of the White House. Whitman, a great deal of Whitman can be read in front of the White House. Now, it speaks to our moment. The thing about poetry is that um, it's timeless. Uh, one, one epic can speak to another, can address the, another's concerns. And so I think we'll be drawing from the works of other poets for a good time to come. But the people now are, are I believe, concerned, awake, worried, and that will affect their writing as we go forward. And the history of the world is written in art and culture. What the future will know of us is only through art and culture and literature, as Asar Nafisi so eloquently said last night. So I think, um, I think that people be better be mindful of that, that, um, that their posterity is in the hands of their artists yeah. and their historians. 
I'm not sure they're thinking that. They're not thinking that way, but they had better. I would advise that. It's the better part of wisdom to protect your legacy. How do you do that? You do not do it by attacking the arts and humanities. Well, I, I hope that um, we don't have to find out about yeah. that and then we can find a way to, uh, to calm down. And I to agree kind of with you. bring things down. But I agree that um, if it gets there, that the artists are going to be key to making sure that it's recorded for posterity and forever. And, and they will sustain others. They'll sustain others by their voices and their words. And, and I think it's, it feels a little scattered now, but everything feels a bit chaotic now, does it not? Oh my goodness, you, yes. So, um, but I think that there's a kind of way in which um, these things are spontaneous and local and moving and inspiring, and it seems to be tireless. It's not going away. That's no, new. in fact, I think it's lighting a It's, it's lighting new a fire. in my life to see that. Yeah, really? Yes. I went through the, I was young in this, you, we are both from Detroit. We were, I was young in the civil rights um, movement, and I was a young woman in the anti-Vietnam War movement. I saw both of those things. This is different. This is different than anything I've ever seen. Really? What do you see that's different about um, it? I'm well, curious. As someone, I was very young during the Vietnam War era, and I've likened what's happening now to the late 60s. But this is different to you. Well, um, I think that why it's different is that the, Viet the anti-war movement was a movement to end conscription, and it was also a movement that had to do with a war on the other side of the world. The civil rights movement was the legacy of slavery. It was the necessary movement forward to, of liberation from that horrific industrial enslavement that created the wealth of the United States for a people enslaved in this country. This affects all the aspects of American life, all, on home ground, in our own country, in our own time, all age groups, it affects people who are concerned about militarism, the environment, women's rights, immigrant rights, racism, xenophobia, misogyny. It's all been coalesced now into, a, a, I think, a, a unified vision of what we need to do. Well, I appreciate the, all the work that you've done. And I love the fact that all the work that you've done in the past has now been embraced and validated, and there's so much more work to do now. Now that it's been validated, we have more work to do. <laughs> Thank so, you so yeah. much. Carolyn Forche, so nice to meet you. Thank you. Thanks for being with us today. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you.